on this uh, stage we have Dave Ross, which makes me extremely proud because He's not somebody who is a frequent speaker, so it's something very special that we have him here today and that we could motivate him to come all the way from Redmond to wonderful Hamburg to speak about his experience. And if somebody has experience about in web security and especially in browser security, it's Dave. He has been in the trenches longer than I guess anyone in this room or probably in this building. So he, he used to be with the Internet Explorer team for a long time, being there the security guy and then moving to the trustworthy computing group at Microsoft and Redmond, which is the brain center of security probably in the whole world. And so you can say he is the missing link between the browser and the security. And I think he had more impact on security in our daily lives when we interact with the World Wide Web than most of the other people anywhere. So with no further ado, Dave Ross. All right, so let's talk about HTML sanitization. Um, so who am I? So I'm Dave Ross, uh, as uh, Martin mentioned. I'm on the MSRC engineering team, Microsoft, uh, which is part of Trustworthy Computing Security. Um, so I work on uh, vulnerability reports that are sent in um, and handled by the, the, uh, the Microsoft Security Response Center, trying to make sure we ship out updates and generally uh, that they actually resolve issues and don't uh, I uh, don't have uh, serious issues, um, so I work closely with product teams and, and uh, uh, things like that. So uh, you might know me from the, uh, the recent IE bug bounty uh, program that we had. I worked on the, the triage team for design level issues. Um, the IE cross-site scripting filter, I worked on that for many years. Um, uh, Internet Explorer security in general. And uh, then also the Twitterverse, uh, I'm Random Dross. So what are we going to talk about today? So uh, we'll talk, uh, this is about HTML sanitization, of course. Um, we'll define exactly what, uh, what's in scope as uh, uh, being considered uh, HTML sanitization. We'll talk about a number of different sanitization bugs that we've, that we've seen as examples and try, and try and determine what are some lessons from, uh, from seeing those. Um, think about you know, if there's a better, uh, 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 there may be a better, a better mousetrap there based on the sanitization approaches that we have today. And I kind of pondering that myself, I built a little research project I've been calling uh, JSanity, which is yet another sanitizer. It's, it's uh, a client-side sanitizer based on browser primitives. Um, and we'll talk about what the design principles are for that, um, how it's implemented, do a little demo, and uh, talk about the future and wrap up. All right, so HTML sanitization, I want to be careful to define sanitization as the process of uh, taking some markup that may be unsafe, um, doing something to it, processing it, and result, then you result in, uh, you have some markup that is safe for some definition of safe, uh, usually, for, usually against script execution, um, but there are other, other attack scenarios we'll, we'll talk about. Um, so input is unsafe HTML, output is either uh, safe HTML or uh, a DOM tree, which is, which is safe. Um, I, the thing to be, dis I, I just want to make the, make the distinction between HTML sanitization and encoding. Um, HTML encoding, URL encoding, that's not what we're, we're going to talk about here. This is really the, the process of taking some markup and making it safe for presentation on, uh, in, in web content. Um, so this sanitization is actually everywhere. The canonical example of HTML sanitization is a web forum where uh, people are able to post, uh, post messages with rich, you know, rich markup, but you obviously don't want script to be injected there. Um, you don't want to be able to post a message with script. Um, and then it's showing up in more and more places in, uh, in modern web platforms in Windows 8, in the JavaScript-based applications, store applications. There's sanitization that happens automatically when you uh, insert content into the DOM using inner HTML. And then, of course, uh, mail applications, web mail applications are uh, uh, prominent consumers of safety uh, 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 HTML sanitization. Outlook.com, formerly Hotmail, um, of course uses HTML sanitization to show you email messages without script execution, um, uh, script executing from those mail messages. Uh, that would actually be uh, fairly catastrophic. Um, uh, you can, you know, this is basic, the basic cross-site scripting scenario. If you've got script running from a mail message, some really nasty things will happen, you know, and they may happen as soon as you view the mail message in your preview pane which sometimes appears even without user interaction. Um, you know, if somebody can execute script, they might then be able to set up forwarding, steal all your mail, send mails you, et cetera, very bad. 
situation. But looking at san sanitizers um, and looking at the, you know, looking at what we have out there, these bugs, bugs and sanitizers, um, bypass issues are just still very pervasive. Um, and thinking about why that is, you look at, you know, how are we going to prevent that? Well, fuzzing is interesting, right? There, there's been uh, a bit of research on, uh, uh, on how, to, um, uh, how to identify sanitizer bugs on fuzzing, and I know some people are actively uh, are using fuzzing, and I know people are actively doing that. Um, I linked to some uh, uh, research from Alex Sotorov, uh back in, back from, I think, 2008 uh, in this area, and it's, it's doable. It's just you need somebody really smart behind the keyboard driving, driving this process and uh, building this, this, fuzzing, this fuzzing. Threat modeling? not really so relevant to finding sanitizer bugs because the threat is that script executes when you, uh, uh, when you render content and uh, uh, really anything beyond that. The actual bugs are usually specific implementation bugs in the code that you might not have realized at the time you were doing the threat modeling. It really takes smart hackers, people like Gareth Hayes, who sit down, you send them off at a sanitizer and they come back with bugs. Um, uh, it takes a lot of work to find this stuff. and, and um, you know, this is, uh, this is all happening on top of a platform that's continuing to change. HTML5 is, is changing, um, or, well, HTML in general is, is, is changing. There's new elements, new attributes, um, interesting new things that affect, uh, affect sanitization. And so it's a really hard problem. So let's look at some bugs. Um, so here's one that uh, Neil Poole found recently. Um, and this is actually one of several that, that he identified. I'm just pointing out one of these issues. Um, this is where uh, you, have this, you have some input here that uh, you can see it is, uh, uh, it is essentially a script tag uh, with some, uh, some text in the middle of it. The sanitizer removes that text. You wind up with output that is a fully formed script tag. The script executes. The ob observation here, I'd say, is that you know, removing markup uh, can create cross-site scripting where it didn't, it didn't exist before. So the sanitizer has to worry any time it modifies uh, markup that, that's going to go to, uh, that's going to eventually be rendered. So here's another bug. This is in the uh, safe HTML library that's uh, uh, from Microsoft from back in 2011. This was a pretty, pretty clever find here. Um, you can see uh, in, in the original input here, you can see this expression uh, if you've, uh, uh, you know, if you're, you're, you're into sanitizer bugs, you recognize, and cross-site scripting in general, you recognize CSS expressions as being a pretty, uh, uh, a pretty interesting way to execute scripts uh, on older versions of Internet Explorer um, and even newer versions in, in legacy document modes. Um, in this case, this expression, this CSS expression, won't actually execute in this, uh, in this style, in this style element. But what happens is sanitizer comes along, and for some reason it decides to HTML encode this ampersand here, and lo and behold, you get uh, ampersand AMP semicolon. The semicolon happens to be a delimiter in CSS. So you, now you've just inserted, the sanitizer has inserted this delimiter, and all of a sudden, the expression becomes the right-hand side of a CSS property set operation, and that will end up executing script in the browser. That's, uh, that's pretty nasty. So I'd say there's, the interesting thing to notice here, the primary interesting thing, is that there's this mismatch between what the sanitizer sees and then what the browser will eventually see. Um, and that, that's, in this case, it's due to this modification that the sanitizer made uh, to the markup. So uh, here's another bug. This one was from uh, Christoph. Um, uh, and thank you uh, to Neil Poole and Adam Baldwin to, for forwarding this one my way on Twitter. Um, this, I think, also was part of a batch of, a batch of issues. Um, and this one, uh, you can see that there's this... Uh, uh, there's an attribute here with a, uh, with a greater than symbol. Uh, in the attribute value, uh, the sanitizer sees that and says, oh, the image tag ends here. Of course, it doesn't. And the on error event handler executes. It's the same scenario with this button, uh, button right here. The uh, sanitizer sees this, so it says, thinks the tag ends, but of course, the browser doesn't, and on, the on focus event handler executes script. And so that's another case where um, the sanitizer and the browser sort of have this mismatch. They don't, they don't see, the same, see things the same way. Um, but in this case, there's not really actually any content modification required. It's just a difference in what the sanitizer and the browser saw. So here's a fourth example. Um, this one is from Sneak on Twitter. Thanks, Phil, for sending, for sending this my way. Um, uh, this one is pretty simple. It's basically the sanitizer, in this case, uh, didn't recognize, for some reason, uppercase href attributes 
would recognize lowercase href attributes, but not uppercase. And so uh, this JavaScript uh, URL would pass through sanitization. Of course, if you clicked on this link, then script would execute. This is another one where there's no content modification required to uh, actually make this work. Um, uh, and the sanitizer and the, the browser really didn't see eye to eye here. Uh, they didn't agree on what, what really constitutes an attribute name. So what's the lesson in all this? So I think at a high level, um, well, there are a couple lessons. At a high level, sort of parsing and context management, um, whatever you want to call that process, um, I would say parsing um, uh, is a reasonable term. It's, it's, it's very difficult. Um, you know, sanitizers need to exactly emulate what's happening at the client side. And guess what? It's not just IE, and it's not even just one version of IE. It's every version of IE and Firefox and Chrome and every, everything that should reasonably be, be supported. Um, you know, it needs to output safe markup that's safe for everything. That's, uh, that's, that's kind of hard to do. Um, and so there's, there, there's an opportunity for a vulnerability anytime the sanitizer and the browser get out of sync. Second conclusion or lesson here, I think, is that, um, you know, if you think about it, parsing is really the difficult part of sanitization. Really, when you think about what a sanitizer should be doing, it should really be all about deciding what tags, attributes, CSS properties are okay to make it through onto the page, like what is safe. Um, but really, they get, uh, uh, they often get, uh, 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 they have a lot of parsing logic that, um, that's complicated and uh, uh, is not really necessary and creates this opportunity for differences to arise between, uh, between the server side and the, and the, or, uh, the sanitizer and the, and the client. Um, logically, the sanitizer was built to define uh, just the business logic, um, and its value isn't actually derived from being yet another HTML parser. Um, uh, and if you think about it, all the bugs we looked at previously, they're, they're really all about that parsing and context management. So maybe we can get rid of that. So why not just use the browser's own parsing? Um, there's no, you know, even if the browser is sort of wrong in what it's doing in some sense, there's still only one, one thing in that, in, in, in that case. There's no separate, you know, parsing in the sanitizer and parsing in the client side. It's just one thing doing the parser, so it can't really be wrong. Um, and the implication here is that if we build a sanitizer that would, uh, that would, would do this, um, that would naturally be on the client side. Well, client side uh, 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 code is only more popular than it's ever been before, and you know jQuery is uh, is on the client side. Uh, that's an interesting library. Maybe we can make a jQuery plugin. So that's exactly what I did. Um, I went. Uh, I decided to uh, uh, spend some time building uh, building a little research project. Uh, I've called JSanity. It's an experiment in building a better kind of sanitizer. Um, uh, so just going through the uh, the security advantage advantages of this really quickly. In theory, um, it should be fundamentally not vulnerable to the most prevalent and difficult to address uh, sanitization vulnerabilities because it doesn't, it doesn't parse, really parse markup. Um, it doesn't have regular expressions. Some people don't like regular expressions for some reason. Um, <laughs> doesn't have any, no parsing. Um, it has a pervasive allow list strategy, which is a general, general good security best practice. Um, it doesn't trigger mutation-based cross-site scripting. I think there's Mario in the audience. Uh, <laughs> um, that's, uh, uh, that's a very interesting problem that is, uh, that is pervasive in web apps. And I can say at least that the sanitizer doesn't, doesn't make that problem worse. It doesn't involve itself in mutation-based cross-site scripting because it only goes from HTML to DOM, it never goes HTML to DOM, back to HTML, and back to DOM again, which is where you really start to get in trouble, have these uh, uh, mutation-based XSS bugs. Um, so the JSonity is configurable, so um, it's very configurable. So it can provide the right level of sanitization for a given scenario. And there are some scenarios, um, for example, you know, you might want your hosting page to be able to allow data-foo attributes through onto the page through sanitization, but otherwise block all data, all other data attributes. And that's doable with this, with this approach. Um, you can build, you, you can have callbacks that essentially do processing and help the sanitizer uh, uh, make the right decisions for the content that it's sanitizing. It's also, um, it's also simple. If you get rid of the parsing logic from any sanitizer, um, you wind up with much less code. Um, and in truth, this is really only a thousand lines of code uh, right, right now. Um, uh, and so yeah, so 
uh, what are the design principles of this thing? So we want to be secure by default um, against injection of script um, and against injection of everything else. So there's been a bit of research Mario has done, uh, Michael Zalewski has done on sort of post cross-site scripting attack uh, or uh, uh, interesting attacks that don't involve the execution of, of script. Um, so for example, you might worry about uh, CSS um, fixed positioning may, uh, uh, making it through sanitization because that would allow you to position content over parts over top of other parts of the page and overlay content that maybe you, maybe the sanitized con content shouldn't be able to overlay. Um, you don't want to allow iframes through. You, w you worry about forms because if you can inject a form, then you can uh, do sort of a phishing kind of kind of attack. Um, you can you can ask someone, hey, type your pin, you know, pin number, whatever. Um, external content download. So for email, the email scenarios, you don't want to automatically ping back a server when you render a mail message because that tells that 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 essentially notifies the uh, sender of the mail message. Hey, you just read the mail message. So that's uh, that's a useful feature uh, in some cases. Um, uh, namespace squatting attacks where you know you don't want content to be able to set the uh, a name or an ID attribute that's going to conflict with something that's already on the page. Um, unclosed tags and attributes. You don't want to be able to have, say, an image, uh, an image tag that has um, uh, an href attribute that it leaves open to sort of swallow up content from the rest of the page. Send that out somewhere. That would be that's a pretty nasty uh, information disclosure bug. Um, so that's just in terms of being secure by default. Uh, in terms of being compatible, we want to be cr cross browser to the extent that it's possible. Um, you know, IE9 uh, at at the minimum. You know, we you know we want to want to have support for anything that's anything that's out there today, not build something that's impractical to, uh, to deploy. Um, we want to be performant, at least competitive with other techniques that are out there. Um, so let's talk about this, uh, this, uh, this little JSANity experiment. So the basic facts of it, um, it's a jQuery plugin, as I mentioned, it's about a thousand lines of code. Uh, I'm just gonna walk through the process of what it does really, really quickly. There's about five steps. First step is to use the create HTML document API to parse markup into a DOM. Um, so you have the raw markup, it winds up in a DOM structure. Then you walk through using the TreeWalker API. You walk through, and as you do that, you remove things that you, you don't want. Um, initially, what I was doing was building up a separate, entirely separate DOM tree, pulling the things that I wanted out of, out of the tree that I had, putting it in here, only the things that were acceptable, not script tags, obviously. It's, in theory, a little bit, a little bit less secure to sort of uh, start whacking out things you know you don't want. Um, it's, still, uh, it's still an allow list strategy, but in some sense if I would miss, um, if the code would miss um, uh, for some reason not, if it were, would not be able to see uh, certain elements or attributes for some reason during the tree walk, then in theory that would be a little less secure. But it is much more performant than building a separate, an entirely separate tree. So that's our approach, our approach for now. We could step back to the sort of more more theoretically more secure uh, approach if we wanted to. Um, next step is the finalized tree is attached into the DOM of the page under a specified element. Um, and then we resolve a jQuery promise because um, this is built to be asynchronous. Um, so we, the API, it's an API effectively that you call from, from within client side code and the, uh, the API returns immediately but later on it's, uh, uh, it tells you, hey, I just finished. Essentially it gives you a a callback, which is the jQuery promise object, um, says I'm, just, I'm done now, um, and everything is rendered on the page, and that's it. Um, so let's talk a little bit about this API, create HTML document. So we need to make sure that, um, or that API must never run script, and it must never pull external content. And those are the two basic security guarantees that it, the, entire, uh, the entire sanitizer really relies on. Um, we really just want this API to parse and build a DOM, and that's it. Um, uh, implementation bugs in the API should be, should be fairly straightforward to fix because these are fairly straightforward guarantees. Um, I do want to talk a little bit about some additional sec security properties, just breeze through here really quickly. Um, uh, we allow list elements, attributes, CSS, et cetera. We have namespace support to uh, allow SVG through. We prefix, as I mentioned, we prefix name and ID attributes to avoid squatting scenarios. Currently, because of a bug Gareth found, we. Uh, drop class attributes, um, uh, and those need to be handled by a callback on the, on the hosting page, although uh, it would be nice to handle that, handle that case in the sanitizer itself, and I think we'll do that in the future. Um, we constrain the display area of output, and, and I'll demo this in a little bit. 
uh, we constrain the display area output to mitigate these overlay attacks where content within the sanitized markup could otherwise potentially overlay content on the page. Um, we validate link URLs to avoid script injection. Um, we support callbacks for custom validation and translation of links. Um, and caller, callers um, uh, can even specify, or hosts of the sanitizer can even specify script that runs on click when you would click a link, and I'll, I'll demo that as well. Um, uh, we allow regulation of external content. We have a very conservative rule set by default, and uh, we validate that the sanitizer itself is running in a secure environment, not IE5 or something like that, to make sure that um, uh, everything is everything makes sense. Um, so we built this thing, um, and uh, you know the first thing we want to do is get some uh, 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 pen test mileage on this, and so. Uh, Gareth Hayes took a look at it and found some interesting bugs. So one was this class attribute issue that I had mentioned previously before, uh, where he realized that you can have multiple class, uh, class names, of course, within a, uh, a class attribute, and we would only prefix the first one. So that was a problem, and now I just sort of uh, punt to the host to deal with the class attribute. In the future, um, we'll probably handle that scenario a little better. Um, we also had some denial of service conditions where, uh, for example, the math elements, um, uh, if it, you know, it actually doesn't contain a style property, the code would blow up there. Um, we had a, uh, a scenario where um, data attributes, uh, if you had a sort of semi-malformed data attribute, that would uh, uh, cause the sanitizer to explode, and so we had to throw that into a try-catch. We had a, um, uh, he found an interesting DOM squatting issue. Fortunately, we failed secure by default, but the idea was that you would send in an element with a name that conflicted with uh, the method name of uh, one of the methods we were, you know, um, uh, or I think that may have been the property name of uh, um, of some of, of something we were using to actually remove that element, and so the removal would fail, the sanitizer would would not proceed, um, uh, and various other implementation bugs. Fortunately, we didn't wind up with something that was sort of the smoking gun that said, "Hey, this just won't fly," right? So I'm pretty happy with that. We're able to fix these issues. So what about compatibility? Um, so this is, uh, it, the JSANity is cross-platform, it's based on JavaScript. Um, advantage being that uh, JavaScript sanitizer is easily, you know, easily auditable compared to a black box, which is, uh, you, you know, which is something, you know, you wouldn't necessarily be able to audit easily. Um, and HTML is actually updated pretty frequently. So one problem that sanitizers often have is they're asked to allow lots of new things through. Um, and they're under pressure to do that um, as, uh, as, as the underlying standards change. And so we can handle that pretty well, um, either allowing things through by default um, on an opt-in basis or with custom callbacks. Um, there is one drawback here that we do require these primitives in the browser to exist, and so there's no support prior to ID9 currently. Um, performance, uh, we are... Um, uh, we are asynchronous based on the based on jQuery promises, um, and we leverage the set immediate API um, to essentially queue up work so that um, the sanitizer will uh, the sanitizer won't do one long sanitiz sanitization operation, freezing up the browser while that's happening until the end, and then the page continues processing. You need uh, you need the page to remain responsive while this while this work is being performed, even if you're sanitizing a lot of markup. Uh, we don't have multi-threading today because web workers can't really touch the DOM. Um, but let's talk a little bit about uh, performance competition here. We do, essentially, we would compete with server-side sanitizers, which have zero client-side performance impact. Um, it's really hard to compete with zero client-side performance impact when you're a client-side sanitizer. But um, you can pre-compute, uh, you can use JSANity pre-compute sanitization and, uh, and sort of have a perceived... Um, uh, uh, have, a, have a perceived zero performance impact. So that's, that's good. Um, we also compete with the two static HTML API essentially because that's a client side sanitizer. Let's talk about that a little bit. Um, so we built a performance benchmark to compare ourselves with uh, two static HTML. We took, the, uh, we took markup from the um, uh, 10 major websites. Um, it was about a meg of markup from the front page, meg, one meg total. Um, and uh, we benchmark how long this would take. And so I, I built a little test framework that would um, print out a dot every 10 milliseconds as sort of a heartbeat, and print out an X if uh, five heartbeats were skipped, 50 milliseconds. Um, and so we started benchmarking the benchmarking JSONity, and what we saw first 
looked basically like this, a long freeze, and then we were done. And this was when JSON was implemented you know, as a synchronous API, so everything was blocked on this process. So that was not so good. So we ended up here after some performance work and, and building the asynchronous, uh, uh, making the code asynchronous. You can see that sort of some work executes, there's a little bit of an opportunity here, various places for other script on the page to execute. And in the real world, and you'll kind of see in the demo in a minute, this results in a very responsive page and a, and a responsive experience. So you don't have, even with a sanitization of a mega markup, you don't have a huge freeze up here. And then um, uh, in this case, uh, just to give you an idea of how long this took, it's under a second for, for one mega markup. One mega markup is quite a bit. Um, but what does the comp competition look like? Well, two static HTML is amazing. It's native code. And so uh, if you look at two static HTML without actually inserting markup into the DOM, uh, it is super fast, uh, 140 milliseconds to all done. The only thing we can say here is that we're, you know, our API is asynchronous, so we return immediately before 100 millise 140 milliseconds passes. But we still do a lot more work. But then if you look at uh, two static HTML, when you actually insert markup into the DOM, there is this huge, uh, it, for, the, for our particular test case, it takes a long time. Uh, and that turns out to be because there's um, style elements that make it through, uh, through sanitization almost uh, in their entirety and, uh, and cause uh, rendering in the browser to do quite a bit of work. Um, this also allows for uh, CSS overlay, um, that, that overlay scenario that I'll demo in a minute. Um, so what are the conclusions here? Well, Raw two static HTML is tough to beat. We went on the synchronous res response time, but I think we can say that JSONity is fast enough that rendering speed is really what dictates overall performance, not the performance of the core sanitization functionality. And I think as we allow more through, as we allow more style data through uh, in style elements, um, we are going to get a little bit slower, but we're going to we're going to end up staying more secure. We're never going to allow so much uh, CSS through uh, that, we, um, uh, that we have sort of the same, the same behavior with regard to like overlay scenarios and we end up allowing so much through that we end up with the same, uh, uh, we, we end up with the same performance as we saw with um, uh, two static HTML. So um, another, another conclusion I'd say is that pervasive use of deferred uh, with set immediate sort of pro has proven itself to maintain a responsive UI, uh, which I'll demo. Um, so now I'm just going to do a little demo. Here's, here's some code. It may not be easy to read, especially if you're not, um, uh, if you haven't used jQuery before, but it's essentially setting up two target elements and it's saying, so here's one target div. This is an element on the page that is the target for an HTML sanitization operation. So the DOM that we construct is going to land under this element. Um, we specify the input here. This is, uh, this is the markup that uh, uh, that's going to get sanitized. It's just raw markup. And we, uh, we also have some options that are passed in. Here's another target. This is a span on the page. We also specify here's the input and we set up some other, here's a callback for link clicks. Um, uh, and then we call sanitization over here. We call the API and say, go do your sanitization. Um, and then, so that's kind of how you would use, use uh, this API on a page. So I'm going to jump into a demo. Um, I think I need to duplicate, duplicate my screen, otherwise move this over here. Maybe it's better if I just demo like this. So um, you can see this is just a straightforward demo of how of the functionality of the sanitizer. Um, you can see a script element here. You can see uh, an image element with some uh, with an uh, event handler. These are both obviously going to execute script. Um, let's inject without sanitization. You can see both of those, uh, both of those execute. If we sanitize this markup, of course, they don't execute. The sanitizer is operating properly as it should. Um, and I can show you what that looks like, what the output markup uh, looks like. And you can see there's no script tag, and the image tag has a sanitized source, uh, source attribute. Um, so here's something, here's a demonstration of the data attribute callback functionality. So you can, uh, this is where the sanitizer can set up callbacks for different parts of sanitization. Um, what it's going to do is uh, set up a callback that looks at, uh, that will flag any data attribute and alert what that attribute name is and the value and actually change the value. So here's the code for the, uh, here's the code for the callback. This is the hosting page setting up this callback that's going to execute when the sanitizer encounters any da data attribute. Um, 
So here we go, the callback has been called. And you can see it's, it found the attribute and shows you the data. And when you actually look at the output markup, you'll see that the uh, value has been modified. That's good, you can handle uh, different things in the uh, markup. The other thing I wanted to demonstrate here is the prefixing. This is what prefixing looks like for IDs and names. Uh, target data is the name of the target, uh, the target element under which this is, uh, the markup is being uh, uh, produced um, or attached into the DOM of the page. Um, and that's to prevent squatting attacks. So here is the SVG. Uh, here's an example of uh, SVG that goes through the, uh, goes through sanitization and the overlay attack scenario. Um, so you can see I've got some CSS set up with fixed positioning. The first thing I'll do is sanitize with two static HTML. And you can see it's kind of not a great uh, scenario where you have something that was sanitized, but it's still overlaying other content on the page. It's not great in some cases. So uh, sanitize with JSonity and you get it nicely constrained within the target element that's the target of sanitization. Um, link handling, link, call, link callbacks is the last demo here. Um, these are three links. JavaScript links, of course, won't work. Relative links by default won't work, although I think you can implement a callback to uh, uh, allow them or allow them conditionally or prefix them. Um, and here's a link to uh, Microsoft um, that I set up a callback on, uh, uh, an on-click handler. So the hosting page did this. Uh, this would be interesting in a, like an email scenario where you want to have some sort of notification before the user navigates somewhere else. So that worked. That's good, but I'm not connected to the network, so uh, don't go anywhere. Um, and then I wanted to show the benchmark as well, what that, what that looks like. All right, so first I'm going to do, this is a page, again, it contains uh, the uh, sort of the, the, the markup from, the, from uh, 10 different websites, um, about one meg of markup. I'm gonna sanitize that with two static HTML. Insert it in the DOM, you can see that's super fast here, and then it completed. The pound sign means it's done, all done. Um, but then I'm gonna actually do that again, but I'm gonna insert that markup that two static HTML generated, I'm gonna actually insert that into the DOM. And you can see, like the, you can see the button's kind of frozen there, it's chugging away, parsing, it's finally done. And then you've got uh, all the style data went through, and so you get this interesting effect here with you know, content from the, uh, from the markup actually wound up outside of uh, you know, the, the, essentially this overlay scenario that I described. Um, so let's refresh the page and sanitize with JSonity. And it takes a minute here to reload all that, that mega markup. But uh, okay, here we are. So JSonity, there you go. It's nice and responsive uh, while, this is, while this is happening. And you can see there's an opportunity for script to execute here, uh, script on the page to execute while sanitization is completing. So, all right, so current status for JSonity. So uh, it is essentially feature complete, but I wouldn't say it's done and that it needs real world testing. It hasn't been deployed on real world websites today. It's kind of the direction I wanna go in here. Um, uh, challenges that, I think the one major challenge for, uh, for right now is we do need better processing, a better solution for style elements where you know, we wanna be able to walk through style data, pull out what we want, um, and not allow other things through. And today we just punt back to the hosting page to say, you know, you should probably just process the style data for us. And I think um, customers of the sanitizer are gonna demand that we do something a little bit smarter by default with style elements rather than just drop them. But other than that, it's pretty good. It looks pretty good. Um, in the future, so we're investigating how to make JSonity more broadly available, I wanted to come here today and say it's open source, but it's not, right? It's not yet, all I can do is sort of demo it. Um, if you can't wait, I sort of described uh, how this entire process works, so feel free to build your own. Just remember it's kind of hard to do uh, sometimes and you wanna find some uh, good pen testers who, uh, who, can, who, can, who can test it. Um, uh, it would be great to get this integrated into some frameworks. Um, jQuery, you know, wouldn't it be cool to be able to have a sanitizer uh, uh, client-side sanitizer built in. Um, uh, it would be nice to be able to, you know, in, in uh, Win8, client-side JavaScript-based apps, there is some default sanitization. What if we could override that, that built-in sanitization with JSonity um, and mitigate if there are issues with the built-in sanitization, you just drop in this JavaScript, uh, 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 just one line, and 
you get you get uh, sanitize, sanitization based on JSonity that uh, um, that avoids that problem. Um, future. So uh, one thing that looks really interesting for JSonity is the shadow shadow DOM uh, feature that uh, I don't think was intended specifically for security purposes, but it does allow for isolation of sort of widgets uh, that you create within. Uh, uh, within a single DOM. So it's something that we might be able to leverage in JSONity in the future uh, as soon as it's sort of supported across uh, 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 most, most browsers that are out there today. Um, competition for us, uh, the big one would be seamless, uh, seamless frames plus sandbox, source doc, and, uh, and I guess CSP as well. Um, put all those things together and you've got a nice little solution with frames, with iframes, where you don't have the problem uh, with iframes that, uh, you know, CSS does not go through into your iframes. Uh, so you need to include the same CSS inside the iframe as you would uh, outside if you want it to be styled the same as the rest of your page. Um, you know, iframes are just rectangular. Seamless frames sort of resolve that issue and allow you to have, uh, in theory, non-rectangular non frames. Um, there are some potential disadvantages relative, relative to JSONity in that um, the configurability of, this, of the, the seamless frame approach um, uh, is limited. Um, for example, you know, uh, if you wanted to, uh, to do the mail scenario where you wanted to have a callback before you click the link that says, hey, you're navigating somewhere else. Do you, are you sure you really want to do that? Either that is going to be possible within, this, within uh, seamless frames or it's not. It's kind of binary. So, um, you know, the configurability of a JavaScript-based sanitizer is maybe desirable in some cases. Um, and it does have limited uh, uh, sir, sorry, seamless, seamless frames are, uh, are not, uh, uh, you know, not broadly available today, limited support for that. Uh, in the future, obviously, that's going to change. And, um, uh, and so, yeah, it's, uh, um, I do want to give credit where credit is due. Uh, definitely, you know, the, this, this is really an API based on techniques that were really were pioneered by a few amazing people, uh, Mario Heydrich uh, in the audience. Um, and Gareth Hayes. Um, you definitely want to look at their research and check, check that out. Um, I do want to give special thanks to uh, Ben Lifshitz and Lars D'Antoni of Microsoft Research, uh, who did some foundational work on JSONity and actually used it to demonstrate um, the fast domain-specific language for tree manipulation. Um, uh, other shout-outs, I would definitely uh, say, you know, uh, definitely want to mention the Google Kaha HTML sanitizer, which is client-side. Um, uh, though it does parse HTML. Um, I want to mention Stefano and, uh, and Eduardo, Sir Darkat Vela, um, who have definitely you know, done some pretty cool work in this space. Um, conclusion. So I'll just read this slide straightforward. Um, uh, HTML sanitizers, uh, as they exist today, have uh, recurring unnecessary bypass vulnerabilities due to parsing or context management. Um, I think we've established, established that. Um, it's possible to build a client-side sanitizer that offers a fundamental security advantage relative to server-side approaches. Um, it's based on brow browser primitives that exist today. Um, it's got acceptable compatibility and performance characteristics. And I would uh, wrap up with just a prediction that five years from now, I think you know, uh, the majority of top-tier applications and frameworks are going to support client-side san sanitization based on browser primitives. And we may see server-side sanitization sort of fade away. Um, and that's it. And I'll take questions if we don't, I don't know how we are on time. Uh, I think we've, you can come, come and ask me afterwards. Um, so first, I'll, thank Dave. Thank you. And indeed, there's time for questions. And I see first hands. Let's see if we can do this with the mic. Okay, uh, thanks for a nice talk. Uh, so it would be nice for this to be in the, the native API in the browser, right? And not having to do it with client-side technology. And, and we seem to have been figuring out what we need to do. So how do we make it happen in browsers? For instance, could I, Internet Explorer be the first one to implement such? I, think, I think the direction there is, is you know, if you're going to implement it in baked into the core browser, then you're talking more about something like Seamless. Um, whereas you don't have the, you know, the advantage here is around the configurability of a JavaScript-based API. And I don't think we'd wind up with a chunk of JavaScript baked into the browser itself. It's more, seems, 
seems to fit in a little better with the frameworks. And you know, frameworks are going to be around for a long time, I think, as well. So um, yeah. Um, have you investigated a possibility of using the same technique, so kind of the browser-based engine, but on the server side, like for example, this Phantom JS, so one of the browser yeah, that's, engines. Yeah, so I haven't done that. That's something actually that Ben Lipschitz and MSR was really interested in doing. Um, the trick there is you would have to, in, in order to sort of gain that advantage of using one, you know, the proper rendering engine, one single engine to do parsing, you would need to take the exact, uh, an implementation of the exact engine that you know is at the client and have an, an instance of that at the server doing the parsing for you, uh, parsing into a DOM. And that gets a little bit, a little bit tricky, especially with Internet Explorer, I think. Um, uh, you need to have you know, pretty much everything living up on the server. So if everybody's got a client, why not just do it at the client? Yeah, so. um, I actually have two questions. My first question is, with the HTML5 standard actually mandating how to parse HTML, do you see any chance that it might be less of an issue that there are parsing mismatches in sanitizers um, if you don't use the browser to parse I, HTML? I definitely think that the standardization of that uh, is going to make it a lot easier for sanitizer developers and browser developers to do the right thing. And it, when there is an instance of a bug, it will be much easier to determine who is at fault uh, because the right behavior will be specced out. Okay, so my second question is, um, there are other libraries like that that you compare with libraries like bleach.js, which is actually widely used in Mozilla products um, on the web, which basically does something very, very similar, but it doesn't use the, the DOM parser, but in, <laughs> in, HTML, in JavaScript HTML parser that is according to the HTML5 spec or aims to be that, like that. Did you compare to other, in general, other JavaScript libraries which aim to do the same? I haven't, I haven't seen that. I need to take a look okay. at that. So it's, um, it's on GitHub, bleach.js. Okay. Bleach. So, any more questions from the audience? If I don't see hands, then we give a hand to Dave. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.